folks. So, as you'll probably note, Xena's not here right now because they're laying down with a migraine. We're going to send lots of love to them. So when you watch this video, just, just do that. Um, I'd like you to put a comment down below that says that, Xena, we love you and that we miss you. Okay? What I want to talk about today is SRS, or for those who don't know what that, that acronym means, referring to um, sexual reassignment surgery, or what is generally called these days, gender-affirming bottom surgery, right? So your mom, me, has been really considering SRS for the better part of a year and a half. Um, when I first started transitioning, I didn't have really any bottom dysphoria, right? Like very little. However, as things have changed, that is my face is more feminine, my hair is long, my shoulders have lost significant uh, mass that I had gained through weightlifting, um, my legs are smooth and good, and um, I now have these awesome tits. My bottom half doesn't quite match the rest of me now in a way that I'll talk more about later in another segment, but for the time being, it basically sits in this place of something was bothering me. So I started doing research on SRS, and through a friend of mine who is a fan of this channel, Vera Thandi, um, sadly, uh, sadly a, a very, very attractive trans woman, uh, sadly because uh, she's monogamous and thus, uh, now I'm sad. Anyway, there will be other girls to flirt with. Anyway, I like girls. Anyway, I started asking Vera Thandi who did her surgery, and her surgery was done by a gentleman uh, who doesn't actually work that far from me, a couple states over, and... Um, I started looking because I wanted to understand, okay, how does SRS work and what does it actually do? And so one of the things that I think any one of us who's a trans femme thinks about is, okay, what do we want done, right? What's the actual goal? Initially, I kind of joked around for a while saying I wanted what was called penile preservation vagioplasty. This is essentially a way to create a vagina using other materials, like uh, I think it's the perennial pull-through method, maybe. Um, while maintaining the penis. And what that does is essentially, um, I mean, let's just call it what it is. You get to be a FUDA. That's what I was going to refer to myself as. So I'm just going to use that term. Um, I believe the actual term queer wise is Salmasian. Um, you can look that up yourself. Salmasian. The reality is, is I don't know if that's really what I want. Um, as much as I think that's interesting, the problem is in and of itself, the penis. That is, I've been reading a lot of Yuri lately, and the big issue is, is that I know that for me, as a trans woman, regardless of what conservatives or TERFs say, my womanhood is not dictated by what shit is in my pants. It just, my genitals don't determine that. And we know demonstrably there is a very big difference, as Contrawell pointed out in her, her video about our traps gay, that girl dick is not the same thing as boy dick. The issue I have is, is that I can say that when I look at another trans girl. That's easy. When I look at myself, it gets a lot harder. It's really hard to validate that for me. There are acts or things that I want to go through, physically or sexually, that I can't. Um, penetration, for one, is a hard one because I don't really like anal. Or at least I don't think I do. I'm willing to give it a shot, but I don't know. I've never really thought about it. It's never been something that's come to me. No pun intended. There are things that I want to experience that I feel like would be incredibly validating gender-wise that I think SRS would grant. But there's also this thing within the trans community that also is very difficult. The trans community is really weird around girl dick. I'm going to put it out there like that. And you guys can get mad at me or upset at me. I know why it happened. It happened because of the, the essentialism of previous transsexuals basically believing that you could not have a dick and be fully transitioned. And so those who were low income or could not afford or could not for whatever reason were sort of left behind. And so there's this been attempt in the last 10, 20 years in the queer community to sort of validate and, you know, celebrate girl dick, which is awesome. That's how it should be. But it's also led to some really weird phenomenon. Examples include um, some trans girls who are just basically cheat like chasers. They just come off as kind of chasery. It's weird. Um, and it's not that their attraction to tr other trans girls is a thing. It's, it's almost, and it's not even the T for T crowd, though they do hide in there. It's more this thing of the over accentuation of girl dick while ignoring trans girl pussy. Like neo vaginas are a fucking wonder of medical science. 
And so we have this these weird tendencies that like float throughout the trans community. On the one hand, you have trans medicalists who are saying you have to do all of these things. Otherwise, you cannot be a true woman. But like on the other hand, you have the liberation crowd who thinks that if you F get, get FFS, you're somehow, you know, dealing with internalized transphobia. Like th there are these extremes in both directions that are horrifying. And it does kind of turn to a kind of, kind of fetishization, Emery. You're right. So it turns into this thing where it's like the girls who still have their dicks are kind of treated as a commodity, while girls who have been through SRS are kind of silently not interacted with in the same way. It's almost like no matter what we do, cis transphobes are still going to say we're trans girls. They're still going to say we're just, you know, men pretending or some shit like that. But like on the other side, the sort of silent thing that's not really ever said is that girls who get SRS just become girls. It's almost like their transness ceases to be. And that weirds me out. That fucks with me because there's a way in which we don't celebrate those people because there's this association with privilege and shit like that. And I just, I find the whole thing really disturbing if I'm really honest. Is this making sense so far? Chat, are you guys, are you guys getting this? Is this, is this landing? So like the issue I have is, is that, you know, you're on Twitter and, you know, you're talking to various different trans girls and things like that. And you'll see, you know, everybody who's all over the gender spectrum, you know, you'll see, you know, femboys, you'll see a whole bunch of, you know, just crazy all over the place stuff, which is great. It's lovely. It's wonderful. But the problem is, is, yeah, it feels like we've sort of done this thing where before where we would commoditize through transmedicalism, the requirements that were so privilege laden back in the DAY that were forced on us, by the way, by the medical industry and by um, by doctors who literally would not prescribe you HRT or um, give you surgeries unless they thought you were f***able. Again, please read um, Julia Serrano's book, um, The Whipping Girl, because holy shit, there's some damn shit. There's some damn fucked up things that happened for people that were transsexual. And the nice thing about the whole girl dick stuff is that it also has invited non-binary people. If you're an AMAB non-binary person, there's a way in which like you may not want surgery and that's cool. That's fine. You may be a trans girl that doesn't want surgery. That's cool. That's fine. But there's still this, this vibe. And so I wanted to understand SRS better to see if it was right for me. Um, but also not if they thought we were too f***able. That's correct, Tiamat. Yep. They, she directly states that in the book that eventually they became wise to you were over femming. And so if they thought you were too f***able or too, or too femme, they would be like, they thought you were gaming the system. Because it's not allow you to be your gender as you exist. It was back in the DAY, it was you had to be super femme, but not too femme. See the problem? It is the damned if you do, damned if you don't thing, oh, oh, well, just as you said. So one of the things I wanted to talk about was a really interesting blog by a YouTuber by the name of Dr. Z. Uh, Zena's mentioned Dr. Z many times, and Dr. Z is a pretty f***ing great YouTuber. I highly recommend her videos. Um, she does almost entirely nothing but gender-affirming therapy. Um, weirdly enough, we work in the same field, basically. Um, I would love to talk to her at some point. Her website is very easy to navigate, um, drzphd.com. And she has blogs, and her blogs cover all sorts of stuff. And the one I wanted to talk about today was this lovely one. Trans women, the myth behind the self-lubricating vagina. So I said earlier that to some degree, one of the things that we are always kind of inundated with, inundated with is that, is, you know, when you're going through SRS, what does that look like? And so the understanding is, is there are roughly three types of SRS, which we'll be covering here. And... The thing that's really important to take into consideration here is, is that a neovagina is by its, by its measure, a wonder of science. It is incredibly impressive. The fact that we can take pre-existing tissue and construct a functioning organ that does pretty much everything it needs to do for the most part is incredible. But to say that that organ exa exists exactly the same as say a cis girl's vagina is not entirely true. Depending on who you ask, there can be a difference in texture, though that seems to be mostly uh, a one-sided argument. There's very much a belief that these things are basically the same. Um, you have a vagina that can have muscular contractions. You can have, a, you know, it has absolutely a functioning clitoris. You absolutely can orgasm. In some cases, it can produce lubrication, though maybe not a ton. And in many cases, you may need lube still. So we'll go into what she talks about here. 
So she goes into the same thing we just talked about. When it comes to vaginoplasty, it's natural to desire a neo-vagina resembling a cis woman's vagina as close as possible. And while surgeons are able to achieve exterior aesthetics indistinguishable from a cis woman's vagina, the internal biology still comes with some challenges. This is, by the way, why when you see um, tra uh, transphobes post in chats and things saying, you know, seethe, cope, dilate, this is what they're referring to. Trans women, when they go through surgery, have to dilate. Um, now, if you're having regular sex, eventually this becomes a thing. Um, less so. Um, and over time, you have to do it less and less because the body just gets used to having that orifice. But yeah, um, to be clear, though, dilation wands are used by cis women to deal with things like vaginismus. The idea that these things are just for trans people is insane. And yeah, Pratt Platypus, you're absolutely right. Everyone should have lube around. What the f***? The number one thing I hear from trans women is for a self-lubricating vagina. When I probe deeper, asking why self-lubrication is so important to them, I often get a mixture of misinformation combined with some elements of truth. I don't want to have to use lube during sex, which can make sense because to some degree, you know, that can be a thing. Um, you don't want to interrupt, but I mean, you can find fun ways to use lube. Come on, guys, be, be creative. Um, if my vagina self-lubricates, I don't have to dilate. That is wrong. You still have to dilate. Shut up. Um, a self-lubricating vagina means you are a real woman. No, you were a real woman before the surgery. If you identify as a woman, you are a woman. There is only one rule in our chat. Self-ID is the only way, one true way. Right? You guys get that? There is no other thing that's allowed. Any other argument essentially leads to a gatekeeping argument and is by its nature just authoritarian bullshit. There's no need to have a standardized system there. The gate is open. Leave it open. And there is more depth with a self-lubricating vagina. That is not true. A self-lubricating vagina means my partner won't know that I'm trans during sex. That one I'm not... No. Like, see, Opal just said, Opal's AFAB and uses lube. Yeah, it is totally normal. I've used lube with almost every partner I've ever had, and I've, I've been in ongoing relationships with AFAB people my entire life. Yet the number one reason I hear is a desire to have a vagina that will self uh, will produce additional lubrication on demand upon a self sexual arousal. But what exactly does it mean when we say a neo vagina self lubricates? How similar is it to a cis woman's vagina? Most importantly, does it produce lubricant upon sexual arousal, as many tend to believe? Now, before we get into this, the one thing I want to make abundantly clear is that anecdotally, there are a lot of trans femmes who have surgery and they produce lubrication. Now, if they have something other than penile inversion, that's pretty normal, but again, the outcome is varied. With penile, uh, with penile inversion, the I've heard reports of people, you know, you know, basically kind of being constantly lubed up or having some variation. Um, she mentions in here a little bit about why that might be, and I know that some of this stuff affects me. I'm not going to go into the specifics about what my body's doing. But if you're a trans girl who's been on HRT for a while and you notice that you often get like stains in your underwear or you notice that your body produces a certain, you know, it, the body down there is just different. The texture's different. Maybe it's a little bit more uh, moist, things like that. These are probably good signs if you do penile inversion because that means that the, uh, I forget which gland it is, TMAT, remind me which, what is the, the comparable gland in, in AMAP people? You know this better than I do, dear. Which one's the which one's the one in in AMAB? What's in the one, which one's the one in AFAB? Because I know it's a combination of the prostate and one of the two glands, but I can't remember if it's the Cowper or the um, Bartholomew gland. Because I can never remember who has which. Which one do AMAB have? Okay, so AMAB people have okay, okay, cool. Yeah, so it's the Cowper gland plus the prostate can produce its own lubrication. You remember because it's backwards because Bartholomew is one in in, in AFAB that. Makes sense, actually. That's a really good mnemonic device. Um, anyway, for starters, let's briefly discuss vaginal lubrication in cis women. A natural... Hey, Lena Maverick, how you doing? Um, naturally produced fluid that lubricates the inner terrain of the vagina. In cis women, vaginal lubrication is an ongoing natural process which tends to increase near ovulation and during sexual arousal. Funny story about this, if you cycle your, you cycle your uh, progesterone, I'll talk about this at some point, but when you cycle your progesterone, your body will actually produce more fluid out of the prostate and the the Cowper's gland. Um, that's been my 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 um my experience is that during the times when I'm cycling my progesterone, 
the two weeks while I'm doing that, there is way more stuff than there is when I'm not. Um, so I'm wondering if it's duplicating those effects and everything I've been able to look up as far as what happens during hormones during this during a, um, an AFAB person's menstrual cycle seems to point to that that being true. So that's again points for the fact that trans women do experience a cycle. Um, they just don't bleed because they don't have a uterus and a uterine lining to shed. Um, shut up, destiny. Moving on. No one cares about your your weird fucking uh, manifesto. Postmenopausal women tend to produce an insufficient amount of lubricant, often leading to potential painful vaginal intercourse. As a result, lubricant is highly recommended. Lubricant's highly recommended when you're in fucking your 20s, dude. Um, vaginal lining of cis women has no glands. Therefore, the main source of lubrication is due to plasma from the vaginal walls through vascular engorgement. In addition, the Bartholomew's gland, which secretes mucus to augment the vag vaginal wall secretions. Near ovulation periods, cis women produce cervical mucus, which further produces additional lubrication. Right? So, as you can see, in cis women, various biological functions are responsible for creating self-lubrication. But what about in trans women? To find out, let's look at each type of vaginoplasty. Penile and virgin, va uh, penile and virgin vaginoplasty. This is my understanding is the most... Yeah, natural lube is basically made of part of what's in blood, plasma, and essentially mucus. Yeah, no matter who you're doing oral sex on, it's weird. I'm just throwing that out there. And also, these are neat. Anyway, moving on. Penile inversion vaginoplasty is in of itself produces no lubrication. Now, again, people can debate this, but this this see this is what she is uh, she is saying. With the exception of the small glands in the urethra, which is generally if you're a trans girl and you're on HRT, you'll notice there are there is, tends to be more moisture around that part of the body. Dr. Gallagher, a, proper, a prominent gender-affirming surgeon, says the small glands in the urethra, which secrete pre-ejaculate, are left intact in trans women. It's highly variable how much is secreted, about 0 to 5 milliliters, which, by the way, is a not, not a small amount. 5 milliliters is a decent amount, but that can give some lubrica lubrication during arousal. Another prominent gender-affirming surgeon, Dr. Wittenberg, elaborates further. If a person pre-comes with ex ex excitation preoperatively, that is, from the existing cowper's glands and some additional fluid from the prostate, then that will persist post-operatively as those structures stay in place. For these women and gender non-binary individuals, there is a chance they may not need additional lubrication. So to put that in perspective, folks, if you're in my situation where you have regular you know, decent amount of fluid being produced by the Cowper's gland and by your prostate, which not only seems to be true when I'm not doing anything, but when I'm being intimate also seems to be the case. That is a good sign that lubrication may not be a thing. And so that that's kind of cool. That's really fucking cool. Now, let's talk about the other two. Sigmoid colon vagioplasty. Part of the colon is used for inner lining of the, vag the vaginal canal secretes mucus acting as lubricant. The amount of mucus secreted and the frequency varies from person to person. See Princess Opal? So it's basically what they're saying is post-op wetness is essentially pre-cum. Yes, some of it. Anyone that's ever given anyone like a hand job and like, gosh, liberty, there's a lot of stuff here that might get, need to be edited. Sorry, love. Um, but anyone that basically give anyone a job like if you've ever had a partner who's like kind of has a lot um like yeah i mean like you can use that stuff as lube god knows i have um <laughs> so yeah that 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 is that is pretty fucking cool um and if you're producing a decent amount of it between that and what the prostate produces yeah like, that's that's really cool dr wittenberg says Colonovagioplasty has the most copious amounts and is mucousy in nature. Most women wear one to three panty line, uh, thin panty liners per day. So because this is literally using a part of the colon, you are essentially producing your own mu mucus. And the thing here is, is that that's awesome because it's, it's just mucus. Mucus is just neutral. But thing here is, is that, you know, you can have to wear panty liners because, you know, you may produce too much. It is important to note that the sigmoid colon vaginoplasty does not secrete lubrication upon sexual arousal. It just does it. If you are having vaginal intercourse, you may still need to use lubricant. 
With the exception of some individuals who who are able to produce lubricant via the copper's gland and the prostate. So this one sounds like it's one of the best ones because if you already are having the effects of the copper's gland and prostate like myself, then by definition, doing this means you're adding mucus, you're probably getting as close as possible. The reason why you have to be careful though is, and talk to your doctor about this, is that sigmoid colon vagioplasty is one of the more risky procedures because it is literally taking a part of your body from elsewhere and then bringing it into that. Obviously, they do this in a very clean, very effective, very surgical way, but there can be complications. In fact, my understanding, and again, I'm not trying to say I'm a doctor here, but my understanding is this one can have the most complications. So talk to your doctor, please. Oh, she got a little misspelling there. Um, the last one is the perennial pull-through vagioplasty. Parts of the perennial used for the inner lining of the vaginal canal produce a small amount of watery yellow tinged lubrication that is consistent or constant, Dr. Wittenberg. As with sigmoid colon vagioplasty, most women have to wear one to three thin panty liners per day. It is important to note that the perennial pull through vagioplasty does not secrete lub lubrication upon sexual arousal. As with sigmoid colon vagioplasty, if you are having vaginal intercourse, you must still use lubricant with the exception of some individuals who already produce lubricant via their Cowper's gland or their prostate. Note that with both sigmoid colon and per, uh, perennial pull through vagioplasty produce moisture within the inner vaginal lining acting as lubrication, there is a difference between an ongoing self-lubrication that takes place in a cis woman. So even if you do have that lubricant, if your body's not naturally producing it, say through the prostate and stuff, you can wear that down. If anyone's ever not changed the oil in their engine, eventually that shit will stop working. It is especially important to note that additional self-lubrication during sexual arousal, which occurs in cis women, does not necessarily account in trans women, except for the individuals who still produce lubricant via the Cowper's gland and prostate. If you are seeking vagioplasty, make sure you are clear on what matters to you most. Talk to your medical provider and have a clear understanding of the pros and cons of each technique. Ask yourself if you would prefer to wear thin panty liners or to use sexual lubricant during intercourse. And remember, cis women experience vaginal dryness and often have to use lubricant during vaginal intercourse as well. Self-lubricant, lubrication, or lack thereof does not define you as a woman. Based and true. Right? So we love we love her. Dr. Z is great. I highly recommend her stuff. What's this? I didn't even know there were multiple ways to make a vagina until recently. I thought it was just basically turn a penis inside out. So funny story is a lot of people seem to have this belief Maybe this is because of that episode of South Park with Dr. Gar or Mr. Garrison or Mrs. Garrison. I forget which. <laughs> She's been all over the place. But basically, long story short, is that um, a lot of people seem to think that neovaginas are essentially just a hole. Turfs love throwing this out there. They love calling them like, what, axe wounds, fucking wounds. They call them all sorts of gross shit. They're not. They're a functioning organ that does some really inter interesting stuff. And if you actually understand anatomy like an adult... You understand that very clearly. If I know I don't watch South Park. Um, but basically, you learn and understand that, like, I don't know if you guys have ever seen this, but, like, you do realize that the parts are analogous, right? Like, everybody starts sort of, sort of pseudo or quasi-female and then through androgens becomes male, right? Like, this stuff, humans are, are not, like, it's not like these are two separate species, right? <laughs> if you, like... This is why you can have intersex people like, um, what was her name? Emily, oh, what was that? What was her name? Emily, the lady on TED Talk. I'll have to look it up again. But the lady on TED Talk, like literally, is intersex, has a vagina, has, you know, all that. But instead of having a uterus, has testicles um, where her ovaries should be, right? She's androgen insensitive. So what she should have been is, by definition, if she wasn't androgen insensitive, would have been, you know, AMAB. But instead, she is a woman. Right? Like, she just is. Um, and people see her and see her as a woman. Now, poor girl did have to go through a shit ton of medical examination because do because the doctors were basically being creeps. But um, what's really fascinating is, again, my DNA is similar to hers, XY, and yet she's been a woman her whole life. This shit is, like, turfs make this stuff up. They don't know what they're actually talking about. You can actually, there's a really cute gif on... Um, what is it? Um, there's a really cute GIF on Discord through Tenor that actually shows like the shifting sequence between um, 
the vaginal canal, you know, the urethra, and then how they shift into a penis, you know, and all that. Like these things are, yeah, before you come out of the oven, it's all the same ingredients. True. So I wanted to share this, this with you because as I'm trying to figure out what I want to do, I have a, a consultation in November and I'm still not sure what I want to do, but we'll talk about that in another segment. Part of me really wants a pussy um, because the idea of being um, intimate with somebody, uh, particularly girls with uh, strap on, sounds like, sounds rad. Um, or, uh, you know, trans girls. Um, that sounds neat. Um, there's also just better toys for people with, with badges, just dis, you know. On the other hand, um, again, I might change my mind. I don't know. Part of it is, is that there are, there are things that I'm not sure on. And so as I go through this, um, you know, it may end up being that I have to, you know, make a decision at some point and, and I don't know what that's going to be yet, but I wanted to share you, share with this, you got, you know, share this with you guys. Cause this is the thing I think every trans woman can kind of relate to is trying to figure out like, what the f do we want? How do we want to do this? Um, I also want to be really clear that regardless of what surgery or not surgery you get, you're still a woman. If you identify as a woman, you are a woman. Um, I do a lot of tucking. I have tucking underwear, Lena, and I have, um, I have tucking kits from Unclockable, which I highly recommend. Um, like I wear leotards all the time. They're, they're fine. Uh, Unclockable.com is really good. Um, tucking underwear for Tomboy X is really good. I guess my point here is, is that I don't know what I want yet, but I wanted to share with this so you... Because I think this stuff's really important, and I want each of you to... be informed, right? Things are changing, insurances are changing, and if you push these motherfuckers enough, you can eventually maybe get them to pay for stuff. Hell, Blue Cross Blue Shield told me that they will basically cover SRS, so I'm gonna fucking hold them to that. Um, but uh, let's see what happens. So with that said, I hope this was informative. I hope you learned something. Thank you, Dr. Z, for your website and for your information. Deeply appreciate you as a fellow clinician, and um, yeah, we'll see you in the next one. If you like this video, please like, comment, and subscribe. Also, consider donating to us. You can support us on our website, transgirltherapist.org. You can also help us on our Patreon, link below, or you can become a member here on YouTube. Um, thank you so much for watching.